welcome along to the first episode of the Impact Series. I'm Charlie Webster and I'm going to be your host throughout. Now across the Impact Series, we're going to be speaking to a range of incredible individuals, both known and maybe some that you don't quite know as well, who've all contributed firsthand towards the fight against malaria and whose contributions have impacted people's lives and incredibly important research, both directly and indirectly. These contributions include new scientific advances, tools, policies, funding, huge levels of awareness and voices. Now, our aim here is to highlight the work and the people who are working across affected countries. In addition to the values we hold dear, the speed of response, passioneering, delivering with precision and responsibility, as well as our focus on positively impacting others. We're hoping to kind of like unfold the challenges and also the doubts around it realize those aha moments and understand what in the end has enabled and will enable success in the future. In today's episode, we have the absolute pleasure and privilege of speaking with Professor Janet Hemingway. Now, I I could spend about an hour, I think, Janet, doing your introduction and your resume, your CV is just absolutely incredible. But Professor Hemingway has over 34 years experience working on the biochemistry and molecular biology of scientific enzyme systems associated with xenobotic resistance and is currently professor of vector biology and chair in insect molecular biology at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Welcome, Professor Hemingway. I feel like, Janet, I haven't really done you justice. Thank you very much, Charlie. (laughs) Uh, Great introduction and uh, uh, perfectly done me justice. (laughs) (laughs) So maybe I think, Janet, a good place to start is as to where you're at now and where your thinking is and what you're currently working on. So for about 18 years, I was actually running the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine alongside um, running my own research program. Uh, And then about sort of 18 months ago, I decided it was time to give up a big admin job um, and have fun with the research before I finally decided it was time to retire. Um, At that point, I didn't know COVID was going to hit, but I did know that I really wanted to continue working on infectious diseases and making a difference to that. So I applied for a large-ish scale program. Um, 18.6 million pounds from the UK government to try and improve the speed at which we get drugs, diagnostics and vaccines um, through to the public. Um, I was supposed to leverage that up to about 120 million pounds over five years, but here I am 12 months in with a 200 million pound program um, and the world is going slightly crazy around me. So uh, um, clearly there's still life in the old dog yet in terms of uh, <laughs> uh, doing research and uh, keeping that research activity moving. It's it's fascinating what you just said, because I do want to take you back, but just on that point, do you think that the current situation has helped in any way in terms of awareness of global problems in terms of health and also the awareness around vaccinations? I I think it's done several things. Um, Firstly, I think it's made everybody understand that infectious diseases aren't just a problem over there um, and not where most of us live. Yeah. Or many Do you think that's been a problem that, that we viewed it as over there quite a lot in the Western world? I absolutely do. Um, so lots of people, even now, when I say I spend a lot of time working in malaria, say, oh, is that still around? Is it still a big problem? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because they believe that we've solved those sort of issues and, and that they aren't an issue because they don't see them day to day. But COVID really is as emphasized to everybody that these things don't carry passports, um, that they move around the world, that they can become huge problems for everybody, um, that we can speed up the rate at which we can get new vaccines through. We can speed up the rate at which we get new diagnostics through and we can implement them. Um, And if we can do that for one disease, we ought to be able to do it for other diseases as well, rather than doing things in the old fashioned way. So I'm hoping there's a long term change in the way that globally we look at R&D in this area um, and actually sort of take it right the way through to implementation and actually getting the new products to people who really need them and making that impact. I think there's so many things you covered there and including solutions but also barriers like making sure we get the vaccines and everything that we need to to the people that really need it almost at the last mile but I want to take you back a little bit because where did your fascination for 
I'm going to use the word insects come into play. Was this something that you were interested in from a young age? Absolutely. So I think many kids, and, and I was no exception, were fascinated by anything that moves. Um, <laughs> and so animals from the, the start were my passion. And it didn't matter whether that was an insect. I guess the first insects I kept were cages full of stick insects, which used to oh, drive gosh, my mum yeah. mad because they occasionally used to escape and she'd find them wandering up the curtains. Um, <laughs> but uh, I guess she was less worried about those than the mice that got out and ended up in my bed. And thankfully, the horses and most of the other animals stayed outside um, but it was just that fascination with the natural world um, that sent me down that track of, of thinking I want to do something um, a that um, benefits people at the end of the day but C allows me to uh, travel the world and, and work with different um, organisms other than human beings as well. So then how did it turn into malaria and mosquitoes? Because I know you were studying zoology and genetics at the University of Sheffield. So then how did you manoeuvre your journey into, how did it develop into malaria? Serendipity, like a lot of these things. So as a second year undergraduate, um, we had guest speakers who came in and gave talks. This guy came and he gave a talk about malaria, of which I knew absolutely nothing, um, and about the Anopheles and mosquitoes that actually transmit it. And so I thought at that stage, why is everybody working on Drosophila, um, a fruit fly that has no economic impact at all, rather than on mosquitoes that kill, at that point, it was about 5 million kids a year that, that uh, uh, were dying. But I thought, no, if I'm going to be serious about this, I'm going to have a go at working on mosquitoes. So I immediately went to my um, supervisors and said, look, I want to look at predation behavior in mosquitoes um, and um, see whether I can uh, do a project on that and get to know more about these sort of creatures that cause all this devastation from malaria. So they kind of looked at me and said, well, you know, you need to blood feed those. So I said, right, I'll go and talk to the guy who keeps rats in the zoology department, um, see if I can uh, get an anaesthetized rat once a week for him. And if not, I'll feed them on me. Um, you feed them on you. Uh, yes, uh, set things up. Um, got to know everybody in the UK who was working on mosquitoes then, as I got colonies from the London School, Liverpool School, Manchester University, and the Natural History Museum to put this project together. Um, and never looked back since. So from that point onwards, I've never applied for a job. Um, the jobs have always come and found me. Um, and everybody's sort of been ringing me up before I'm finished with the old job, uh, asking me to do a new one. So I had everybody I'd worked with as an undergraduate asking me to do PhDs with them. And then when I was a year and a half into my PhD, um, a guy from California, George Georgiou, who's one of the big people working on insecticide resistance in mosquitoes at that point, um, offered me a job in California. Um, so I headed off to California, came back from California to London because the guys I'd been working with in London didn't want me to leave. Um, got a Royal Society Fellowship, then Cardiff knocked on the door to see if I would uh, uh, run their preclinical and clinical uh, uh, biosciences programs. So I did that for eight or nine years. Then the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine headhunted me to, to take on the role there all of the time sort of continuing to work on uh, mosquitoes and malaria and other insect-borne diseases at the same time. What made you stay in, in the field? What made you not go into maybe kind of another disease? I know you said that you've worked across various, but in terms of like what inspired you to carry on this study? Because I think I'm curious, like when you entered your career, how much has changed and whether there's sometimes been moments where you feel like it's a you're constantly chasing all the time to try and and and, and combat and eradicate malaria if you can think big and nobody's ever accused me of not thinking big but think big and then think okay well how do I make some of these things happen yeah. um, then you can get a huge amount of satisfaction out of doing that so I learned early on that although I loved science and I loved doing the science I could do an awful lot more by having people working for me 
uh, and doing the science so we could ask bigger and bigger questions. And so now I'd be a complete liability if I ever went back into the lab. Um, but I can still keep up with the, the science itself. I can still help shape those questions. And I'm still in touch with the people on the ground whose lives it makes a huge difference to. So early on, I, I think I went out to uh, Tanzania. Um, I would have been 20, 21. Um, and that's the time, first time that I saw a kiddie die of malaria. Oh. And that really sort of leaves an impression with you that you, when you see that, you go into a hospital, you've gone in there to talk about setting some things up and, and doing some collections and so on. But there is this tiny scrap of a child on, on a bed there with very little around that they can do to actually save it at that point. And you see that child die you realize you're doing something that if you can make a difference is going to save so many of the lives like that. And that does stay with you, that there is a rationale for what you're doing. How important is it to make sure that we don't always look at things on a macro level, like in a lab with science and say in policy boardrooms and actually like how important I suppose has field work been to you to make sure that we're looking at it from from a 360 perspective and actually working with people on the ground? All of these things need to marry together because if they don't, then we're never going to get to the solutions that we need. So um, in many ways, I guess I I see my job as trying to provide products and new solutions to try and understand how those products might be used, but I can only do that by working with the people on the ground and getting their feedback as to why things aren't working or what they need differently. Um, And then if there are still barriers to actually getting these things implemented, trying to work out what it is that we can do to to short circuit some of that as well. So um, it's always driven me crazy when I see great science that doesn't get translated yeah. Um, and even when it get, gets translated, new products that don't get picked up and used as they should because we can't get them through the policy frameworks in the right time scale or in the right format. And again, I guess I've, I've learned over time that rather than say, well, somebody should do that, um, if it becomes obvious to me that nobody is doing that, um, then maybe it is my job to get involved with policy or maybe it is my job to get involved with other areas to try and unstick that chain um, if I've got the connections to be able to do that. Um, and you realise uh, once you've done that a few times that actually you can achieve a huge amount, um, particularly if you know the networks and you know everybody who operates in those networks and people um, react to you as an honest broker there. So you're not coming, yes, you've got an agenda, but not with a, um, a self-aggrandizement agenda. It really is a, an agenda to to get things moving for everybody's benefit. Would you say that's your around your strategy, which I believe you've labeled or you call bench to bush around using tools from basic science to field work. And I know, you you know, you mentioned one of the countries you've been to when you were like 20, but you spent a long time working alongside those local teams. Is that that the phrase that you use? It's a phrase that lots of people use. So I wouldn't uh, pretend that I was the one who'd coined it. Um, I was going to give it you then. (laughs) I I think a few people might be. uh, Yeah, maybe maybe upset if if I claimed it as my own, but but it does describe what I do. Yeah, can you talk through that a little bit more? Um, So I've gone everywhere from um, working with the insects uh, at the bench uh, and actually looking at genes and the way that genes um, interact with insecticides and the way that they produce resistance. So the, the fine detailed molecular biology that you would do in a laboratory um, through saying, OK, how do I turn those into more simple tests that we can take into the field so that we can monitor what's going on with insecticide resistance? And then it was a matter of saying, well, it's not just a matter of monitoring what's going on with resistance, but understanding how that's impacting on disease transmission and how we can either slow down resistance or if we can't slow it down, we can bring new insecticides in there. So I then started working with the chemical companies and developing new insecticides. Um, And then once we got some of those products, 
um, they were sitting on the shelf and they weren't getting used optimally because people didn't understand where um, sensibly they should go and how we could speed up the process of generating the evidence to say this product is better than that product. Um, and so I then started working on large scale epidemiology and field trials and working on policy. Um, and um, uh, there we go. I've gone all the way from uh, taking apart a gene on a, a lab to um, working with the Global Fund and WHO uh, and various other um, normative agencies to change policy um, in the way that some of these things are actually used on a day to day basis. I think, Johnny, you've already mentioned like multiple different approaches in the fight against malaria. And I think it is fascinating that you you chose to fight the vector, the mosquitoes themselves, which transmit the malaria parasite. So can you talk through more about the impact of vector control and the need for tech and technologies around it? It's a hugely important part of, of malaria control. So, um, and one sometimes that gets forgotten and the, the impact of which gets forgotten. So people tend to focus on the treatment um, and yeah. they tend to focus on, I've got sick kids, how do I get new drugs to them? Which is clearly important, but you are never going to eliminate malaria just with drugs, it will not happen, it cannot happen. And so again, it's an old adage, prevention is better than cure, and it's absolutely right for malaria. It's much, much better to stop those kids getting malaria in the first place than to have to treat them. And so how do you stop them? Um, you, um, in, in many cases, reduce the contact between humans and mosquitoes. So you can put barriers there, bed nets, for example, um, they work reasonably well, but they work even better if you put an insecticide on the bed net and that insecticide then kills the mosquito. So not only have you put a barrier between the insect and the person, but you're killing a large proportion of the female insects that come in to try and feed on that person. And so you're reducing the ability of those mosquitoes to transmit malaria. Um, and so I'd long argued that... Um, vector control had to be an absolutely integral part of, of malaria control. And particularly in those countries where you've got very high levels of transmission, if you don't get the vector control right, you will never ever make a, a dent in the amount of malaria that's going on. Mm. And I think we've been proved right in that um, with the great modeling that went on through Oxford about three or four years ago because we'd had such a, a, an increase in activity around trying to reduce malaria transmission um, and throwing drugs at it, throwing bed nets at it and so on, the people from Oxford over a, a five or six year period were able to model what the impact had been of three different interventions, drugs, bed nets and indoor residual spraying. And what that showed was that basically just under 70% of the impact in terms of reduction of malaria had come from the indoor residual spraying and the bed nets and 30% wow. from the drugs. So we need all of them. We need them all working together and we need them all optimally deployed if we're really going to get where we want to go. I suppose, God, there's so many questions I want to ask you around that. Um, maybe, maybe start with how how academic and industry partnerships drive that innovation momentum at the moment because you just mentioned um the the incredible success around insecticide spraying but then also the vaccine so most of the interventions that we've got and most of the data that allows us to to see what is going on here is through that collaboration between academia industry um, ministries of Health and the normative agencies. And if you get all of those groups working together well, um, then they can achieve an awful lot, um, bringing their different strengths to the, the party. There's, there's loads of, of talk about malaria eradication. Do you believe then, because we've talked around some of the different approaches and tools, do you, what else do you think we should consider at the moment and where where in terms, what in your opinion, are we at? 
we are going to have to not just get the tools and technologies right, but we're going to have to get the implementation right. There's going to have to be more funding that goes into that program um, because it's, it's still massively underfunded from where it needs to be. And the funding that goes in there has to be directed to technologies um, put in place in a format that gives you the greatest reduction in transmission that you can get out of that. But we've also got to be in there for the long haul. So doing this for three or four or five years is not going to get us to where we need to be. We're going to have to continue through because the, the real danger with malaria is that it will rebound very quickly. I think the, the argument from the Gates Foundation and others has always been that the world doesn't have the appetite to put the amount of funding in that is needed just to hold this um, at a low level. Because if you're going to do that, that's a phenomenal amount of money indefinitely. Yeah. Um, and so it's better to put a much greater effort in over a short period of time um, and try and get the job done. But if we don't get the job done, there is the danger that it will come back um, because, you know, you reduce transmission by 30, 40 percent. Um, it is not going to stay reduced if you pull back from your, your efforts and from the point we're at right now. Are you concerned that society sometimes looks at things from a short term view in, in terms of what you were talking about, like that we look at things short term and then we take the pedal off the gas like happened in the 1960s? Are you concerned that? It, with the current situation especially that there is that constant need for funds and sometimes things are looked at very short term yes I, I think that is a danger I think there's a difference between the 1960s and now in the, the 1960s effectively we had two tools we had chloroquine as a, a great drug and DDT as a decent insecticide albeit with a whole raft of, of problems that come with it and I think people were naive enough to believe that with those two things we could sort malaria out mm. and the reason um, we got things stopping in the 1960s was it became very apparent that those tools on their own weren't enough and there wasn't enough political will to then be able to to carry these things through so um, I think the difference now is that we've got most of the tools that we need We've got a decent R&D portfolio of new tools coming through, but that political will and the ability to continue to fund and take these things through to completion is going to be a tough one. What do you think the answer is? Probably a really big question to make sure that political will stays. Um, there needs to be enough of us making enough of a noise about it. It needs to stay high on that political agenda. Um, and um, there needs to be enough people who are absolutely determined that it isn't going to get um, blown off track and, and will help carry it through. Are you all concerned, also concerned around other barriers, for example, the prevalence of drug and insecticide resistance? Mm -hmm. Like, What are the real implications around that? So with drug and, and insecticide resistance, it's, it's very obvious. Um, uh, not true, just true of malaria, but for, for any other infectious disease, that you're in a war um, with the infectious disease agent or the insect that you're trying to kill. And you're dealing with very large populations of parasites and insects. So the more effective you are at killing those parasites and insects, the more likely you are to get resistance coming through. And so unless you have a really good resistance management strategy, which means that you need enough drugs or enough insecticides to be able to rotate them or mix them, um, or enough of a new pipeline of new drugs or new insecticides coming in, then eventually um, you will end up with a highly resistant population of parasites and, and insects, and you won't be able to kill them with the tools that you've got available. So the last thing that we want to do is to get to that position. Mm. So um, the, it's really been a two pronged attack. One is to try and put resistance management systems in place um, and make sure people understand those and make sure they understand why, even though it may be a bit more expensive to do that, it's better doing that than it is to use a monotherapy and then find you've lost that insecticide or lost that drug forever. Um, and the other part of that is to actually develop 
um, novel insecticides and novel drugs so that we keep that pipeline filling um, and don't allow that to stop. And for both malaria drugs and um, insecticides in the 1970s, that pipeline stopped. The Medicines for Malaria venture restarted it for drugs, um, but nobody had restarted it for insecticides. And so I kept going around the world saying, somebody should restart this. Um, and, and I think, as I said to you earlier, it dawned on me one day, well, maybe that somebody actually should be me. Yeah, um, it's an interesting <laughs> approach, actually, because I think it, even when you said it earlier, I was thinking, oh, yeah, because I think we often, why isn't somebody doing this? Why isn't somebody doing that? Well, I'm doing this. But actually to switch it around and go, OK, maybe that's something I also need to do. Yeah. Um, and so I actually set up the Product Development Partnership um, with um, the initial funding from the Gates Foundation, um, linked up with partnerships with all of the big agrochemical companies to start and develop new public health insecticides from scratch. Um, and that program, the IVCC program, has now been running for nearly 20 years. Um, the major bed nets that are in use at the moment have come through that program. The dominant formulation for indoor residual spraying with Actelic has come through that program and brand new insecticides will be coming onto the market very soon through that program. Um, I guess you learn from that. Uh, I hope you learn from that. And so I keep going around the world now sort of telling people, um, if you think there's something that should be done, then think about, can you do it? Um, who do you need to get on side to do it and uh, um, have a go at just making something big happen? So what's the, I just want to take a moment for a little bit of celebration of you there, um, because the work you've done is incredible, but also just even having a conversation with you, the way you approach things is incredibly inspiring. Out of the 101 questions, and I know you said the problem sometimes is figure out which one to tackle. At the moment, can you pinpoint one that you feel like we should focus on right now in the world of malaria? Um, I think it's around the high transmission countries um, and it's really sort of saying how are we going to get new tools and technologies into those high transmission areas in a format that is really going to, to reduce that transmission. If we don't sort out the problems that we've got in Nigeria and DRC and Uganda, um, then we're not going to eliminate malaria because unless you can get the transmission right down in those really um, high burden countries, they will reseed malaria through the rest of the African continent. In terms of the DRC, I actually spent a little bit of time in Uganda, right close to the border of the DRC. And you mentioned there some of the challenges of the fact that they don't even have roads. So how do you get the bed nets? Can you talk us through some of the other problems in those high burden areas? I'll, I'll mention one myself and see if it's something you also notice in terms of, of also treatment seeking behavior. Mm -hmm. that, yep. that was what I, I noticed um, just from the short time I spent in Uganda. What would you say the other, the other barriers are? Would it be also like the fact the health system maybe is not set up? The, the health system is, is often not set up. Um, you don't have a, a sensible set of diagnostics available. Uh, people tend to try and get to treatment too late. Yeah. Um, and even if the treatment is provided for free, um, people can't necessarily get to the places where there are stocks in the right time frame to be able to, to do the treatments that they, they need. So it's one of the reasons I've tended to, to concentrate on the prevention side rather than the treatment side, because the better we can make the prevention, the the, the more we reduce the pressure on that treatment side of the equation, which is always going to be difficult. So both sides are difficult, um, but if we can really sort of ramp up prevention, then maybe it becomes easier to sort out the treatment side of it. I suppose it's like with a lot of problems, we often put a plaster over things, but it's just going to be a continuous battle. I, my, ne my next question my, my, I'm, I'm going to ask you this question, Janet, but I feel like we've covered quite a lot around it. But the, there, is been a, there has been a mark in terms of a date put on malaria eradication. And global experts believe that malaria could be eradicated by 2050. Um, since I've known about malaria, 
I've heard the date shift a few times and that, 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 that kind of 2050 mark, what do you believe it will take to bend that curve? Is it focus on prevention, which you've just spoken about? And do you think that's possible? Are we going to see malaria eradicated in our lifetime? Um, not in my lifetime, um, but I may not be here in 2050. So, um, you know, I, I think I'm relatively safe in, in saying that that it certainly isn't going to be in, in my lifetime. Um, and not if we are still continuing at the pace we're going. So um, you've only got to look at the figures that we were doing really well for quite a while, getting that transmission down and it's plateauing. And we all know um, from what's happened with other disease eradication programs that the closer you get to elimination, the harder it gets. Um, the other program I'm, I'm heavily involved with at the moment is with visceral leishmaniasis elimination in the, the Indian subcontinent. Um, and that date has moved about eight or nine times um, in terms of when we're going to get to that point. Um, because the closer we start to get to this, the more people think we can't do it. Um, and so they push it out. I think dates are important just because it does at least give people a target to go towards um, and isn't just a, an open-ended commitment. But I think they also need to be realistic and they need to be reassessed. Um, and I think we just need to work out whether or not that continuous moving of dates um, is actually a help or a hindrance for some of the donor communities because I think the trouble is if you, you get donors coming in who believe that something is going to happen by 2050 and then by the time we get to 2030, people are saying, well, actually, it's going to be 2060, um, then are you going to have damaged your ability to raise the funding and keep that curve moving? Um, and I don't know the answer to that, but I, I just think it's something we need to be careful about with these dates, that they're aspirational dates. Um, they very, very rarely get hit, um, even for some of the simpler diseases that we've been trying to eradicate. And so um, I think it probably unlikely that we're going to hit that date for malaria, if I'm being perfectly honest. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Hemingway, I could carry on this conversation for a long time. Thank you so much for sharing with us, for your insight, but also your contribution over the years throughout your lifetime. There's so many people that appreciate it and the impact that you've had is just absolutely extraordinary. So thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you all of you for watching the first episode of the Impact Series. We really hope today's conversation has provided important insight and can prompt key and impactful conversations. You'll be able to follow the Impact Series right here on the Best of God website. So do keep an eye out for the next episode as part of the Impact Series, where we'll have the opportunity to speak to another great guest about this topic of malaria. Take care. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you soon.